Hi folks and welcome back to part 3 of my video on the Fleet Air Arm Museum at Yeovilton in Somerset. This video is going to feature on the fourth of the four display halls in the museum. And the focus of this display hall is the centenary of flight. As such it features lots and lots and lots of prototype and experimental aircraft. As well as the prototypes, Hall 4 also houses a collection of some of the Navy's most wildly successful carrier-borne aircraft designs as well as at least one example of aircraft that probably wasn't quite as successful as its designers hoped it was going to be. As you no doubt aware by now, the museum is situated on a working airfield and is a very, very noisy environment, so I do apologise in advance for the quality of the sound in certain sections of the video, but it was largely unavoidable, and I hope it isn't going to affect your enjoyment of the video. Westland Wyvern. Um, this was the last aircraft that Westland manufactured before they focused exclusively on helicopters, yeah? That's true, yep. And this is probably why they focused exclusively on helicopters, because this thing was a bit of a disaster, wasn't it? It was. Here you've got a Mamba turboprop engine, and you can see the size of it going back to the cockpit there. Unfortunately, with the double blades it had, it could never quite power both properly, and often these things would crash. The fatalities on these were about 30%. They didn't see any real combat action. Three were sent to the Suez Crisis, and all three were shot down by Egyptian flak. The idea in principle was very good, but due to budget cutbacks and engineering cutbacks, unfortunately, these are more dangerous to their pilots than they were to the enemy. So as well as seeing the uh, enormously powerful engine that came all the way there, one other interesting feature was it had a Martin Baker ejector seat. There was a curious tale about this plane, that one of them tried to take off a carrier, failed, fell off the end, the pilot pulled his ejector seat, was shot out from under the water, and was rescued, being the only man in history to be launched from underwater with an ejector seat. Hawker Hunter, a legendary aircraft. Uh, this thing was one of the most successful export aircraft ever built. Exported to 57 different air forces, primarily Middle East and Africa, although also in the Far East, Malaysia, Singapore, air forces like that used it. Um, phenomenally well on. It had four 30mm AV cannons, which were mounted in a pod. This one was had the cannon pod removed. Basically, the whole bottom of the uh, aircraft was, was a pod section where the cannons were mounted, and they would just drop out. Um, this thing could climb at 80 metres a second. It had a top speed of 1,080 kilometres per hour. Phenomenally well armed. Um, saw action in the, the Yom Kippur War and I think the Seven Day War as well, uh, where it was flown by the Syrian Air Force, the Egyptian Air Force. Everybody flew this aircraft. It was a phenomenally good design. I'm going to have to rush to correct some of the glaring inaccuracies in the uh, previous section when my on-the-spot knowledge of the operators of the Hawker Hunter failed me. It was never operated by the Egyptians or the Syrians, but it was used in the Six Day War by the Lebanese Air Force where one of them was shot down on the first day by an Israeli pilot flying a Mirage. The Hunter on display in the museum is the T-8M, which is the two-seat trainer version, unusual in that it featured a side-by-side -side configuration as you can see in this clip here, with the pilot and the instructor sitting next to each other. The Hunter first flew on the 20th of July 1951, and on the 7th of September 1953, it set an airspeed record, achieving 727 miles per hour. It also had a very, very tough and sturdy airframe, it was incredibly forgiving to fly, very easy to pull out of a spin or a stall. One pilot once even took one through an unauthorised 14G manoeuvre. The aircraft was only rated for 7G, but the only damage that the aircraft sustained from the manoeuvre was that the G counter got stuck at the uppermost limit. Other than that, there was nothing wrong with the aircraft. One of the things that accounted for the astonishing success of the Hawker Hunter as an export aircraft was due in no small part to the efforts of the Swiss Air Force. Now, the Swiss are famous for nothing if not for being politically neutral, and they will buy weaponry from anybody, uh, regardless of the politics of the person selling the weapon system. During the Second World War, they operated BF 109 sold to them by Nazi Germany. The Swiss do not care about your politics. All they want to know is are they going to get value for their money? And so in 1957, when the Swiss announced that they were inviting competitors to submit designs for aircraft that, which would arm the Swiss Air Force from the 50s onwards, there was a lot of interest. Chief competitors were the Hawker Hunter, 
uh, the North American F-86 Sabre and the Swedish Saab 35 Draken. The Hawker Hunter walked away as the clear winner of the trials, due in no small part to the fact that it had such a massive payload advantage over the F-86 Sabre. The Hunter could either carry twice as much and fly just as far, or carry the same warload and fly twice as far as the F-86 Sabre. And so the Swiss ordered 100 Hawker Hunters to replace their existing fleet of de Havilland vampires. Some of the peculiarities of the Swiss Air Force, as you can see here, they uh, operate their Hawkers, Hunters, out of hangars that are blasted into the sides of mountains. And they're also trained to land their aircraft on motorways in the event of the airfields being unusable. Despite its advanced age, remember the Hunter was introduced into service in 1951, it still flies on frontline service with the Lebanese Air Force today. And it's even still used by the Royal Navy as part of uh, FRADU, the Fleet Requirements and Aviation Direction Unit, where it's used to simulate attacks on British and NATO warships undergoing training at Flag Officer Sea Training in Plymouth. Just as an example of the massively fast pace of aircraft aviation technology in the mid 20th century. Remember the, the fairy swordfish, the old string bag, the biplane torpedo bomber that took part in the attack on the Bismarck, as an example. Everybody knows the fairy swordfish. Uh, in fact, we'll see one because they have one here. That thing was designed in the 1930s. 20 years later, the same people that designed and built the fairy swordfish biplane built this. This is the Fairy Delta, built by the Fairy Aircraft Company. It first flew on the 6th of October 1954. It set the world airspeed record of being the first aircraft in the world to fly at more than 1,000 miles per hour, a record that it held for a year before being beaten by a McDonnell F-101 Voodoo. The fastest man in the world, Peter Twiss on the right, holds a model of the fastest plane in the world, the Fairy Delta II, and they're both British. Now for the real thing, the Delta II preparing for the flight which will make history. Thirty-four-year-old Peter Twist gets ready to take her up. An ex-naval pilot with a DSC and bar, he has probably flown more high-performance aircraft than any other Englishman. And the Fairy Delta II is certainly one of the strangest looking of them all. Pilots and ground crew call her the Droop Snoop, because to give the pilot a clear view during landing and taxiing, her swordfish nose can be tilted downwards. Everything is ready and the Delta takes off. To record the Delta's speed to an accuracy of one thousandth of a mile an hour, highly complex photographic equipment is necessary. As she streaks across the sky, we get some impression of her tremendous speed when we realize that that vapor trail is seven and a quarter miles up. Now the return trip over the measured course. Watch this and remember it. It's the first time man has flown over a thousand miles an hour in level flight. The calculations and the checking of reports begin. As Peter Twist brings the Delta in, he knows the records in the bag. The margin was too big for duck. And what a margin. His average speed was 1,132 miles an hour, beating the American-held world record by 308 miles an hour. A splendid achievement for British designers, British craftsmen, and a British pilot. And what does Peter himself say? Just routine. I never know whether or not to be proud or embarrassed by those old newsreels. They're just so incredibly, well, you know, British. <laughs> anyway, next up. This is the Handley Page HP-115. It's a Delta Wing research aircraft built by the Handley Page company. And its purpose was to test low speed handling of supersonic airliner with Delta Wing configuration. It was part of the British Supersonic Aircraft Research Program from the 1960s, sponsored by the Ministry of Supply, that eventually produced the Concorde, the prototype of which you may have noticed sitting there behind it. Now, the reason people were so interested in the performance and handling of swept-wing supersonic aircraft at low speed was because uh, aircraft achieve lift in different ways when they're flying at supersonic speeds and when they're flying at low speeds. 
to get a, a good lift to drag ratio at supersonic flight the wings have to have a very short wingspan and that's fine at supersonic speed but you get very very little lift when you're flying at low speed so in order to make a design that was able to take off and land on existing runways the aircraft would either have to have wider wings and lose supersonic cruise economy have massive engine power or be an extremely large aircraft. The solution was discovered by Dietrich Kuschmann, a German aerodynamicist working for the Royal Aircraft Establishment after he'd moved to England after the Second World War. The basic solution was that an aircraft with a delta wing that ran most of the length of the fuselage at a very, very great sweep angle of at least 65 degrees would have reasonable low speed performance while also keeping the supersonic drag to a minimum thanks to the limited wingspan. And so Handley Page were commissioned to design an aircraft in order to test the configuration at low speed of exactly this kind of uh, very, very long but limited span delta-winged aircraft. And it proved to be a very, very capable aircraft. Pilots were able to demonstrate rapid changes of banking while still safely retaining control of the aircraft at speeds as low as 69 miles per hour. You'll notice from this newsreel footage that the HP-115 actually had fixed undercarriage, it didn't retract. The fixed tricycle undercarriage was actually taken from the main landing gear of a Percival Prentice and the nose gear of a Miles Aerovan. It was powered by a single Bristol Sidley Viper turbojet engine. Incidentally, Neil Armstrong was due to fly the HP-115 as a test pilot in 1962, but after he was selected as an astronaut, NASA refused him permission to fly the aircraft. He did actually eventually fly one, but much, much later, on the 22nd of June 1970. So, with the Handley Page being used to test the low-speed handling characteristics of swept-wing Delta aircraft, and the Fairy Delta II being used to test the high-speed supersonic characteristics of uh, Delta-winged aircraft, they eventually resulted in the development of this, the Aerospecial BAC Concorde. And as with anything developed jointly by the British and the French, nothing went smoothly during the design and development of this iconic aircraft. Even the name caused problems. The name Concorde um, is spelled almost exactly the same way in English or in French, the only difference being that the French version has the letter E on the end. And they both mean the same thing, harmony, union, agreement. Harold Macmillan, the British Prime Minister, officially changed the name to Concorde without an E in response to a perceived insult from the famously British-hating President Charles de Gaulle. Then in 1967, when the French rolled out Concorde in Toulouse, the British Government Minister for Technology, Tony Benn, announced that he was going to change the spelling back to Concorde with an E, and this created an uproar in Britain. It only died down when he stated that the suffix E represented excellence, England, Europe, and the Entente Cordiale. He later received a letter from an irate Scotsman claiming that he talked about E for England but part of it was made in Scotland and Scotland did contribute the nose cone for the aircraft. Ben replied it was also E for Ecosse, which is the French name for Scotland. <laughs> and he might have added it's also E for extravagance and escalation as well. But there's no doubt that Concorde was an absolute technological success and a major source of prestige for both the British and uh, French aviation industries. It was able to do the New York to London flight in just under three hours, which is less than half the time it took other passenger aircraft, thanks to its supersonic cruising speed of just over double the speed of sound. But despite its flight performance, Concorde was never an economic success. Only 20 of these aircraft were made, and due to various reasons, not least of which being the crash of uh, Concorde in the year 2000, Concorde was eventually retired from service in 2003. Underneath Concord here, they've got a very, very bizarre display. And it's a scale model of the Wright Flyer, built by the Wright Brothers. There it is. Um, now, as you know, the Wright Brothers, 1903, they actually built and flew on the 17th of December 1903 this aircraft. It was the first powered flight in human history. What they've got here, and the reason why they've placed it under Concorde, is if you look back up there, right, there's, there's Concorde's tail. Down here, 
they have a spot on the deck. 17th of December 1903, Wright Brothers first powered flight, 120 feet. So this was obviously placed here marking the 100 years of powered flight in 2003. The reason that spot is there on the deck is because right down at the other end you can see Eddie. All right, he is standing under the nose of Concord. And at the deck is another spot which indicates how far the right flyer flew. You think about that. Where my Concorde was flying in the 1970s, within 70 years we went from that to something that could cross the Atlantic in three hours. So we're going to finish off this section of the tour with a look at this, the P1127, the prototype version of the world famous Hawker Harrier, world's first operational vertical and short takeoff and landing fighter aircraft. So let's just have a quick look at exactly what it could do thanks to those vectored thrust nozzles of the Rolls-Royce Pegasus engine that powered this thing. And all of his answers to make sure that we're where the one to be is fuel load is very critical at this point. And what he wants to do. So while he's doing that check, nose point, what a lethal look, and now the power starts coming up. Watch this. And if you're not impressed, whenever you see a Harrier do that, then you have to be dead from the neck up. And it could do that thanks to this, the Rolls-Royce Pegasus engine with the vectored thrust nozzles. Now, while spectacular, vertical takeoff, not incredibly practical. It just used too much fuel. On the other hand, using those vectored thrust nozzles to get a short takeoff, very, very useful indeed. Especially if you're operating your aircraft off something that doesn't have a very, very large runway, like, for example, an aircraft carrier. Now a lot has been made about the use of the vectored thrust nozzles in a maneuver known as viffing, um, where the pilot would use the thrust nozzles to rapidly change the attitude of the aircraft in flight, making it very, very maneuverable as a dogfighter. But it wasn't just the vectored thrust nozzles that achieved this. The Harrier also had what was known as an attitude control system. And what this consisted of was high pressure gases that were vented out uh, of various parts of the aircraft, notably uh, valves in the tail and at the tips of the wings, which would also allow the aircraft to bank, pitch, yaw and roll much, much faster than an aircraft of conventional design. One thing that you don't appreciate from the static displays in the museum is just how loud these things were. Back in the 90s, when the Royal Navy was still operating Sea Harriers, I had the privilege of being based at Royal Naval Air Station Yeovilton, and my cabin was located around about 500 feet away from the landing pan where the Harrier pilots used to practice vertical takeoff and landing. And let's just say it soon became apparent why male junior rate accommodation was situated right next to the landing pans. Female accommodation was situated as far away on the other side of the base as you could get <laughs> and still be in the actual air station itself. And the officer's accommodation was on the other side of the road on the other side of the airbase because when these things are in the hover, nobody is getting any sleep. The prototype on display here at the museum is XP980, the fifth one produced. Features unique to this prototype are the, uh, the taller tail fin and the anhedral or downswept tailplane assembly. Uh, features which survived into the actual development Harrier itself. The prototype P1127s and Hawker Kestrels led to the development of the Hawker Sidley Harrier, 
which was a fantastically successful aircraft, operated not only by the Royal Navy but also the Royal Air Force, the Luftwaffe and the US Marine Corps. The Royal Navy's Harriers most famously saw service in 1982 during the Falklands War when they shot down 20 Argentine aircraft without any air-to-air -air losses of their own. But the Harriers have also seen service uh, in the 90s, over Bosnia in the wars that led to the breakup of the former Republic of Yugoslavia, and in the First Gulf War. Sea Harrier was officially retired from Royal Naval Service on the 26th of March 2006, with its replacement, the F-35 Lightning II, due to have been in service by 2012. But with the Ministry of Defence's procurement process being as incompetent as ever, they're now not due into service until at least 2016, and the price has doubled. A development which shocked absolutely nobody who knows anything about the way the British Ministry of Defence operates. Well, that's it for this section of the Museum Tour. That has been Hall 4, Centenary of Flight, and Prototype and Experimental Aircraft. I hope you've enjoyed the video. There's still at least two more videos to come. Coming next, we're going to be looking at Hall 3, which is the Carrier Flight Deck experience, which is absolutely fantastic, and I guarantee you're going to enjoy. After that, we'll be showing you the Cobham Restoration Hall, which is actually separate from the museum, is only open to the public one day a year, and which the museum staff very, very generously opened up exclusively for us to take a look at the vast range of aircraft that they're currently working on restoring, including what is going to be, when it's restored, the world's only surviving example of the Ferry Barracuda torpedo bomber. The aircraft that took part in the major attack on the German battleship Tirpitz on the 3rd of October 1944. As you can imagine, the restoration project is uh, not cheap, and the museum are always grateful for donations, however small. If you wish to donate to the project, details in the video description down below. Until next time, folks, take care.